Now, Roma Wines present. Suspense. Tonight, The Brighton Strangler, starring John Loder with June Dupre. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you a radio play by Robert L. Richards, based on the RKO picture, The Brighton Strangler. The stars of the production are appearing with us this evening in this drama of an actor who specialized in murder, and of a girl who became the unwilling heroine in a real-life play. And so, with The Brighton Strangler... And with the performances of John Loder and June Dupre, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Midnight and the New Year. It's been such a lovely holiday. April, my dear, I wouldn't stand too near the edge. The rail is very low and it's quite a drop to the street. I was only looking over the city. It's even a lovely night to have a holiday end, as long as it must end. All lovely things must end, my dear. Shall we join the others? It's a bit chilly out here on the terrace, don't you think? No, we can't go in just yet because... Because what? Because something has to happen first. What has to happen? You know what happened to the Lord Mayor of Brighton, don't you? He was strangled. On Christmas Day, and the chief inspector, three days later, he was strangled too, wasn't he? Edward. Don't try to pretend you haven't guessed who I am. No, Edward. You couldn't be... Go on, say it. The Brighton Strangler. You couldn't. But I did. My alibi for the Lord Mayor was very simple. I merely turned his watch back. And for the chief inspector, you yourself supplied me with an alibi. Remember? But why? Why? Because ten years ago, they conspired to send an innocent man to prison. And that innocent man was me. And now, you, my dear, are the only person alive who knows. Edward, listen to me. We're in London. It's New Year's Eve. Don't you remember how... The silk cord. Edward, you're not going to... Yes. <laughs> That's him! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! You've got him! Dead. At last. The Brighton Strangler. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Good night. It's so good, it's so terribly good, I can't bear to close it, and it's making so much money. Well, you're the producer. Don't close it. Put someone else in the part. Oh, you know I can't do that. People don't come to the theater to see the Brighton Strangler. They come to see you, Reggie. To the public, you are the Brighton Strangler. Not after tonight, I'm not. I can't understand you, Reggie. Walking out on a play that gave you fame and fortune. I'm fed up. Fed up to the teeth with it, that's all. Oh, look, Reggie... I won't speak for the play itself. It's only mediocre. I'll grant you that. But you've given it something, Reggie. By sheer force of personality, you've made it authentic, terrifying, a tremendous psychological drama. That's just it. Now, now look here, Shelton. Has it ever occurred to you that a man might feel if he strangled one more person, he'd go stark, raving mad? 
Oh, but it's only a play, Reggie. <laughs> Just make believe. You ought to know by this time that to an actor, a good actor, it's never entirely make believe. Now look here, Reggie. Look here. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give I you. I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone, can't you? Oh, but Reggie, please. Leave I... me alone. Can't you understand? Leave me alone. All right, all right, all right. There's no need to get edgy. Oh, I'm sorry. Got any plans? Or oh, some service canteen shows? Well, if I don't see you, Merry Christmas. Yes. Merry Christmas. Good night. Good night. Uh uh. Air raid. Shelton! Shelton! Gone. Everyone's gone. No time to make the Shelton now. Best stay here, I suppose. Getting close. Too close. This is it. out of here somehow. But where? 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 Yes. Oh, here comes one of the chaps now. Are you all right, sir? Oh, you've got a nasty gash on the head, haven't you? All right, why? Why, yes. Yes, I'm all right. Oh, here. Don't forget your suitcase, sir. Suitcase? Yes. Yeah. Where are you going? Victoria Station? Huh? Yes. Victoria Station. How many? Three return tickets to Orsham. Here you are. And yours? Return to Rottingdean, if you please. Right. Next? Single to Brighton. Brighton. Next? Uh, what's yours, sir? Single to Brighton. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Mr. John Loder and Miss June Dupre in The Brighton Strangler, tonight's tale of Suspense. When you listen to the friendly advice of Miss Elsa Maxwell about hospitality and gracious living, you realize that here is an authority who talks plain common sense all the time. I'm talking to men as well as women when I say that the finest hospitality is always simple, sincere, moderate, and natural. Never the opposite. And so, I'm always emphasizing that the nicest, simplest, most sincerely flattering hospitality is to serve your guests some Roma Sherry with its golden amber color, its deliciously tangy, nut-like flavor. It's not only supremely enjoyable before dinner or in the afternoon, it's smartly correct, a genuine compliment to your friends and to yourself. And please don't worry about special glasses. It's, it's perfectly correct to use any nice glasses that are handy. Well, Miss Maxwell speaks more authoritatively than I can, but I will add this. Roma Sherry, like all famous Roma wines made from California's magnificent sun-ripened grapes, brings you all their fine flavor, aroma, and color, is unvaryingly good, always enjoyable, thanks to the age-old wine skill of Roma's noted wineries, located in the choicest vineyard areas of California. Yet all this goodness and pleasure is yours, for only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. Roma... R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. John Loder as Reginald Parker and June Dupre as April Manby, who now takes up the narrative concerning The Brighton Strangler, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Somehow, from that very first moment, I was drawn to him. He was handsome and attractive, yes, but it wasn't that. He seemed so lonely, so much in need of help. And then on the train, when I saw that he'd really been hurt, I, I just threw a convention to the winds and took charge of him. 
You've been very kind. Well, someone had to put a bit of sticking plaster on that head of yours. Are you sure you're all right now? Quite, thank you. It must have been terrible. I heard about the theater. The theater? Yes, of course I recognized you the minute you stepped into the compartment. What? Well, you are Reginald Parker, the actor, aren't you? I've seen your picture on the billboards dozens of times. Reginald Parker. And I've been dying to tell you. My name is April. April? Mm-hmm, that's the name of the girl in your play, isn't it? And I'm from Brighton. April from Brighton? Only, of course, my last name is Mandy. Well, that's where I'm going, Brighton. Why well, isn't that nice? We do have a lot in common, don't we? Yes, a great deal, I think. Oh, we're going to have such wonderful times in Brighton over the holidays. You know, I was wondering if you wouldn't think it forward of me. What? Well, my family's having a party at our house on Christmas Day. The Lord Mayor and a lot of people are going to be there, and I... The Lord Mayor? Yes, and if you'd like to come, I mean... <laughs> I'm really not a celebrity hound, you know. But if you'd really like to come... Why, I'd be delighted. Oh, Mr. Parker, that'll be wonderful. Uh, April, why don't you call me Edward? Edward? Oh, oh, you mean Reginald Parker's only a stage name? Yes, uh, a stage name. Well, isn't that odd? I, I always knew actors had stage names, but I always thought yours was real. But I think I'd rather call you Reginald. Or at least introduce you to my family that way. It's it's a sort of confusing two names. Well, what's in the name? If after all, what is? Reginald, what's that little silk cord you keep twisting in your hand? Oh, this? Yes. I use this to strangle people. What? Oh, you, you mean in the play. Yes, in the play. Well, do you always carry it about with you? Always. Why? Oh, I don't know. Oh, for luck, I suppose. I've heard of actors having superstitions like that. Do you still have many friends in Brighton? Friends? Acquaintances? I haven't been back for ten years. They'll scarcely remember you, will they? The ones who are important will remember me. They will remember me very well. <laughs> on the dot. Just 5.30 now. Here, let me take your coat. Thanks. Now come along and meet everyone. I'm so anxious you'd meet my parents. I've told them so much about you. I didn't realize you knew so much about me. <laughs> Silly, you know what I mean. Mother, Mother, I want you to meet Mr. Reginald Park. How do you do, Mr. Park? How do you do? And Mrs. Shackleton. How do you do? And Mr. Shackleton. How are you? And my father, Dr. Manby. How do you do? And Chief Inspector Allison. How well, everyone's do? here now but the Lord Mayor. I wonder what can be keeping here. Oh, it's barely 5.30 now. It's a bit of a walk from his place. I expect he'll be along directly. Well, Mr. Parker, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to meet you in the flesh, so to speak, sir. Oh, I have an impression that we have met in the flesh before, Inspector. Not that I recall, sir, and I'm sure that I would. I would have thought so too, Inspector, if only because of our mutual adventures in villainy. Eh? Oh, 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 I see what you mean. Well, sir, I'm a practical criminologist, or supposed to be, and I must confess that I find most of these plays and films and so on about crime rather preposterous. <laughs> Why? Oh, while well, in this day and age a man can't go about killing people without being caught, once in a while perhaps... But when you get these stories of chaps with two or three, a whole string of victims, oh, no, oh, never, never. But, Inspector, they always are caught in the end, if only to prove to the kiddies that crime doesn't pay. But supposing it were the perfect crime? Bosh, there's no such thing. Really? If you're interested in criminology, Mr. Parker, we ought to get together some evening while you're here. Perhaps I could give you a few experiences of my own that would amuse you. I should be delighted, Inspector. In fact, I shall make a point of it. Excuse Good. me a moment. Hello? <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I'll call him. It's for you, Daddy. For me? Oh, thank you, my dear. Yes? This is Dr. Mandy speaking. What? Good Lord. Yes. Yes, very well, I'll tell him. And I'll come over at once. What is it? What's wrong? A terrible thing has just happened. 
We'll need you on this, I'm afraid, Inspector. Why, what's happened? The Lord Mayor has been murdered. Murdered? Can't understand it. He didn't have an enemy in the world. Well, when did it happen? He left his house at 5.15 to come over here. He was apparently attacked by someone who'd been lurking in the shrubbery of his own grounds. He was killed at 5.30. His watch had been smashed during the struggle, and that's when it stopped. And uh, how was he killed, Doctor? He was... He was strangled. <laughs> Fantastic, of course. But there it was, that terrible coincidence. The strangling in Brighton. But I must confess that my main concern was for Reggie. But the way everyone glanced at him, the polite, standoffish way they talked to him was enough to show they felt that somehow he was responsible for the dreadful thing that had happened. As for myself, I felt almost as badly as he did. Thought I'd never known anyone quite so brave. But it was clear he wanted to get away. He was quite free to go, and yet he stayed on in Brighton. They're so compelled to, perhaps by a strange feeling that he mustn't run off until the mystery had been solved. He even made a little joke about it that night that I drove into the house. Well, this is one way of facing the music. Reggie, you mustn't say that. Oh, sorry. Hope you don't mind too much driving me down. Of course I don't. I know you must think I'm a low-down dog for picking the one night you couldn't come along, but it's their only program of rimsky Korsakoff, and I couldn't bear to miss it. I'll come another time. If you want me to. I want you to very much. Reggie, did you ever think that a play might have an effect on people who saw it? How? That someone might see it and want to do the same thing? Oh. Reggie, I think that's what happened. I think that someone saw your play and is trying to do the same thing in real life. Some poor creature with a, with a twisted mind. A twisted mind? Please don't think I'm blaming you. But a play like that should never have been written, should never have been allowed. Perhaps it was just fated to be that way. It's the only thing I can think of to explain the things that have happened. Does it make a great deal of difference to you? Difference? In the way you feel about me. Oh, Reggie, no. Oh, I'm glad of that, because I think quite soon now, perhaps after tonight, I shall have something very important to tell you, April. Oh? Well, here we are. Well, thanks for bringing me, and uh, you will pick me up. At 11.30 sharp. Tickets? Tickets, please, sir? Um, uh, here you are. First on your right, sir. First seat in the last row. Am I late? No, sir, it's just about to begin, sir. on my gramophone. You know it? Sherizard, yes. It's just 42 minutes long. Oh, is it? I never timed it. Here, make yourself comfortable by the fire. I was rather hoping you'd pick this evening to drop in. I'm all alone. I remember you said you'd be. Oh, you have quite a music library, Inspector. Yes. And I see you collect uh, other things as well. Eh? Oh, my private chamber of horrors. <laughs> Interested? Very much. Of course, you did want to talk about crime, didn't you? Well, each of these things, rather gruesome, most of them to you, I expect, is, is like a trophy to me. Oh, uh, we'll take this butcher's knife. Uh, you can imagine what that was used for, I suppose. His wife? That's it. Carved her up, put her in her trunk, and checked her at Brighton Station. We didn't find her for three months. Never did find her head. We got the chap, though. Now, uh, here's something you don't see very often. A hangman's noose. Yeah, the fellow who wore that collar last got me my biggest promotion. It must be a great moment of satisfaction when the boat is pulled and the rope tightens and you know your murder is done for. Yes, it is for a fact. But there's one trophy I intend to have here that'll make me prouder than all the rest. Just a little thing it is, too. Just a bit of cord. You mean uh, the cord that was used to strangle the Lord Mayor? Right you are. And I'll get it. And the chap who used it, too. You mark my words. Do you suppose, Inspector, that the cord you're after would look anything like this? Where did you find that? Oh, I just carry it about with me for luck. You see, 
I have a theory about the death of our distinguished Lord Mayor, Inspector. Oh, uh, have you? But what is it? Let us suppose that many years ago, ten years to be exact, before the Lord Mayor was the Lord Mayor, he was a barrister defending a client in a court of law. And let us suppose that instead of defending his client, he betrayed him to the prosecution, and the man went to prison. And let us suppose that the man returned one day after all those years in prison to take revenge, and he took it. Oh, very imaginative theory, Mr. Parker. Uh, why don't you drop into my office tomorrow, and we'll discuss it further. Ah, but you've only heard half my theory, Inspector. Let us also suppose that the representative of the prosecution to whom this innocent man was betrayed was someone more interested in collecting trophies than in seeing justice. An ambitious man, a chief inspector of police, shall we say. Someone like you, Inspector. Oh, really, Mr. Parker? Then it would also follow that our man would strangle you, wouldn't it, Inspector? I'm afraid play acting has influenced your judgment, sir. This is no play, you Inspector. You get away with a thing like this. You've said that before. Well, people know where you are. Exactly. You see, I am at a oh, concert. No, no, no. no. Ah. Been waiting long? No, it's just over. Did you enjoy it? I don't think I've ever enjoyed a concert quite so much in all my life. Really? Oh, uh, do you have a wireless in the car? Yes, there it is, right in front of you. Oh, yes, of course. I thought we might hear a bit of news. Mm -hmm. Under intense anti aircraft fire, the Raiders were driven off, however, with only a minimum of damage to non military objectives. I have just been handed a dispatch from Brighton. The Brighton Strangler has struck again. At approximately 11 o'clock tonight, Chief Inspector Allison of the Brighton Police Force was found dead in his flat. Yes. He had apparently been murdered in the same manner as the Lord Mayor of Brighton, only three days before, by strangling. Again, there were no clues to the killer. Reggie. It's fortunate, my dear, that you and others know I was at the concert this evening. Fortunate? Because otherwise it might seem almost one coincidence too many. <laughs> Coincidence? Suddenly all this coincidence that had seemed only the trickery of an impossible nightmare became the evidence of terrible reality. How I managed to maintain a semblance of calm as I drove him back to his hotel, I shall never know. The next day he had left, and that afternoon he called me from London. He said it was most urgent that I see him, and I knew that I must go. But first, I went to the police. <laughs> If you know where he is, we'll arrest him at once. But I don't know where he is. And besides, I have no proof. Neither of you, neither is anyone. There's all the proof we need, miss. But don't you see the pattern? I'm to meet him at the Plaza Hotel. And the Plaza Hotel has a terrace. And tonight is New Year's Eve. And my name is April. You'll be taking your life in your hands, miss. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. I pray that I am. Maybe you won't have to do anything and he'll come to you of his own accord when I tell him you want him. But if I'm not wrong, this is the only way to save him. And I'm the only person in the world who can do it. Well, uh, uh, what did you say the line in the play was? He says, and now you, my dear, the only person alive who knows. The only person alive who knows. Oh, you do have a script for the play, don't you? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Because you'll have to come right in on cue. Uh, do you have a copy of the play for yourself? I? Oh, I don't need one. I know it now by heart. <laughs> Eleven, twelve, midnight and the new year. Shall we go in? It's a bit chilly out here, don't you think? No, we can't go in just yet because... Because what? Because something has to happen first. What has to happen? You know what happened to the Lord Mayor of Brighton, don't you? And, and the chief inspector, he was strangled too, wasn't he? Reggie... Don't try to pretend you haven't guessed who I am. Reggie, this is where the lines are different from the play. I've known who you are. Go on, say it. The Brighton Strangler. And now you have the so-called in your hands and you want to strangle me. But you mustn't. Oh, listen to me, Reggie. 
You've been sick. Don't you understand? You've been sick and you've got to get well. And now you, my dear, are the only person alive who knows. Reggie, no. Yes. Applaud, all of you. Applaud. Applaud. Bravo. Bravo. He's let go of her, all right. But keep him covered all the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. He's, He's backing up to the railing. He'll fall. Wait, wait. Thank you very wait. much. Good night. Na- uh- <laughs> As though in a trance, bowing him, as he had so often to so many enchanted audiences at the Brighton Strangler, he stepped backwards toward the low parapet as though again leaving the stage and fell. We found him on the pavement below. He was still alive. It's April from Brighton. We were bombed, weren't we? Then I heard applause. I think I'm hurt. But you'll help me, won't you? I want to take just one last curtain call. died there in my arms. And so closes The Brighton Strangler based on the RKO picture and starring John Loder with June Dupre. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by... William Spear. There is no reason at all, Elsa Maxwell says, why everyone should not have the enjoyment of Roma wines with everyday meals and when entertaining friends. These superb wines of California are so delightful to the taste, so very delicious with food, so smartly complimentary to friends who are your guests. It seems a shame to me that some people still miss out on such wholesomely simple, moderate, and inexpensive pleasure. But of course, Miss Maxwell, millions already do know and enjoy Roma wines. In fact, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. And that can only mean Roma wines are California's finest. Always extra good, unvaryingly fine in flavor and quality. Yet... Only pennies a glass. Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. Before we bring you news about next week's program, I should like for our sponsors, the Roma Wine Company, and for all of us who collaborate to bring you suspense, Mr. Spear, our producer-director, Lud Gluskin, our conductor, Lucian Marowick, composer of our scores, Vern Surrey and Ralph Cummings, our sound crew, Milt Stark, production assistant, Bob Anderson, engineer, and Truman Bradley, our announcer, to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Ida Lupino as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. An open telegram from Washington concerning the Merchant Marine, which should be listened to with vital interest by eligible members of our audience. United States shipbuilding program is being increased at enormous rate. Contracts have been awarded for hundreds of additional new ships. Every one of these ships must be manned by 40 to 50 men, most of them with previous sea experience. Long Pacific distances and expanding supply problems call for continuous employment of large numbers of men and ships until Japan is totally defeated. Universal demand for strong post-war merchant marine makes post-war opportunities in these jobs fully as great as in any American industry today. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.